Hey folks, welcome back to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream Q&A segment. Did we establish it was 154? We did. 154 is the answer to that question. See, we've already got one answered. All right. All right. Maybe we should stop where we're ahead. No, it doesn't work like that. Stop. Well, I'm, I'm not enunciating anymore today. Stop. You're done enunciating? Yeah, apparently. You're going to be slurring from here on out? Yes, without any alcohol even. All right, let's start with the question from Discord this week. They uh, they send in a question of their choice every week, and that's where we start, uh, which you, you can get on there on our Patreons. Regarding the phenomenon in which a fetus can give stem cells to its mother with which she can repair damage to her body, could this be a factor in why women tend to live longer? Probably not. I mean, no. Could it be a factor? Yes, it almost certainly is a factor to the extent that it's real. Um, but first of all, bearing children, very hard on the body. Um, so to the extent that a fetus can provide stem cells, it is compensating for the damage that a fetus does in the process of doing what fetuses do. It's also true that the uh, females of species tend to live longer than males of species phenomenon is more widespread than just mammals. And so uh, you, you have that being true in species that don't gestate. And so uh, there has to be an explanation that goes beyond that, even if it has some truth to it. Yeah. And even in humans, let's say, once we correct for things that happen after someone says, hold my beer, or any of those kinds of phenomena, um, there's still a, a bias. And the long and short of it is more or less this. If you think about um, the mating systems that human beings will have lived under, uh, a male competing with other males can produce a very large number of offspring. This is not an advantage of males because it is equally possible to produce no offspring whatsoever. But the intense competition for reproductive opportunities will cause males to concentrate awesomeness early in life rather than distribute it across the lifespan. So this creates the paradox, more or less, of males being stronger and more fragile in the long run, which is really what is causing this pattern. Um, so effectively, a male who distributed awesomeness evenly over a lifetime might never win a competition, whereas a male who biased awesomeness to a very narrow period of time is more likely to win in that period of time, but the point is it is borrowed from somewhere. I will say there is one other factor here which uh, follows from my telomere work, which suggests that because telomeres on non-sex chromosomes are inherited without respect to sex, that the limitation on cellular repair will fall more profoundly on males because males are larger and therefore burn up some of their lifetime capacity for repair in growth. So that may be an independent reason that males become more fragile. The prediction would be that females have a slight bias in favor of tumor susceptibility even when we correct for female-specific tumors. So do we know what other patterns look like in species where females are larger? It's a great question. Like herps and like raptors? Raptors, for example, yeah. Um, I don't think we do know. Um, in, in short, what's going to be true is you're going to have a bunch of contributing factors. And so in a species in which size roles are reversed, you would expect some fraction of the bias in favor of female longevity to be, to be displaced. I don't think size is a role. You said size roles are diverse, are reversed. You can identify as whatever size you want. So size roles are a thing. <laughs> and sexual, a sexual size dimorphism is the opposite of what it is in mammals in some species. Yeah, that would be a... If you wanted to convey meaning, that would be a way to organize... I like the idea of size roles. Size roles. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's late. We've been dealing with some weather. So, oh my God. yeah, all right. The uh, English yeah. was not as uh, well deployed as it might have been. The... Um, the mo I will, this is a totally different topic, but speaking of some of what we've been dealing with, the fact that it, we've been under a bunch of snow, like really unusually, very unusually cold and snowy for here, 
uh, and that it was promising to go from not having been above freezing for five days to completely above freezing, but still with like freezing rain and snow and like, you know, icy everywhere. As we're just getting up this morning, suddenly a whole lot of water from somewhere is what I'm hearing. Like, oh God, what is happening? There's no one in the bathroom. What is happening? And uh, spigot outside just started gushing. Doesn't seem like, turned it off right away. You got to it. Uh, it doesn't seem to have done any damage, but there's been a whole lot of like, oh God, now what? Now what? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, okay. I was pretty sure we were in the clear. I put my head in the crawl space and I did not hear water. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure exactly what we would have done if I had, but uh, yeah. no, we got it. Yeah. All right. Let's go into the questions um, that you have asked. Oh God, it just unsigned. It signed me out. I'm just gonna. You're gonna stall for a minute. While oh, that was quick. Okay. Yep. Sign me right back stalling, in. By yeah, the way. you are. You're totally done stalling. All right. First question. I'm not sure I understand it, but I'm gonna read it. Via etymology, any word is the end of a long poem, where ideas get repurposed via compounding, metaphor, verbing, nouns, etc. Oh, that's cool. For instance, science comes from a root notion of to separate, also the source of shit. Didn't know that. How does language get bootstrapped? What is underneath it all? Is symbolic language all or none, unlike an eye? Well, I mean, there's a, I guess there's a moment before symbolic language and a moment after it, right? But then, you know, metaphor is in almost everything that we say. Yeah. Right. I mean, even, even this is both obvious and not obvious, but one of the favorite, one of my favorite examples, when I was teaching with a linguist for a couple of quarters, we're teaching a program called evolving communication. And I learned some things about how linguists see the world in, in teaching with her for a couple of, couple of quarters. And the ubiquity of metaphor uh, was for me cemented with the example of um, higher of, of warmer temperatures being higher. What's higher about them? This is based on the mercury, right? This is based on mercury thermometers. And I actually, it took me a few go-arounds in my own head, arguing with myself, like, no, but they are higher. It's higher. Like, there's, there's nothing inherent about warmth versus coldness. That's uh, wrong. Okay, so Zach says... I can turn on microphone. Sure. Zach, Zach, Zach says this is wrong. Zach says this is not metaphor. That warmer temperatures are, in fact, inherently higher. Well, there are several ways in which they are specifically not. Altitude-wise, the higher you go, the colder it tends to be. Well, no, but he, but he is... I know. He's going to make an argument. I'm interested yeah. to hear it, but... Well, my uh, not going to work. But my argument is just that it causes everything to expand because things are moving faster, and so it actually does... There's sense. more motion. There's more motion at, there's at more warmer space. temperature. There is more motion, so that's there's there's more. But is that higher? Yeah, I think this fits with our. I don't. I don't know that higher. more like activity, more activity, isn't inherently higher. No, but it's not more activity. It's more space as well. So more space, but more space also isn't higher. Yeah, right? I'm not seeing it. Yeah, um, my guess is, like everything else, or almost everything else in language, it, it, it is a metaphor. And uh, we often don't spot these things because they are dead metaphors. They are references to things that we don't have a relationship with. Um, but even this one, you know, many people at this point probably won't have seen mercury thermometers. But it's not, it's not dead to us. And yet it's just so, it seems like such a true thing about the thing that is being described. Yeah, it takes on. But I'm on, still having a hard time. This is Zach. It takes on <laughs> like an inherent taking meaning. Taking it apart, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, Zach doesn't agree. Yeah, conclusion. Zach does not agree. Yeah. He's, he's free to be wrong. That's one of the great things about... Uh, Being a Norte Americano. Nor I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, is you're free to be wrong. And very frequently, you're mm -hmm. in a free in a position to um, to impose your will on others, right or wrong. Uh, apparently, yeah. yes. Um, but uh, what I was going to say you was... You want to get back oh, to the yeah. question? Or you no, I think I got it. Yeah. The question was, is it all or none unlike something like an eye? Now, right. this is right. an interesting way to put this because eyes were one of the arguments deployed against the uh, graduated, the gradualistic view of evolution. And we can get into a quagmire here 
Um, my feeling is evolution is gradual, um, which does not mean slow. It means graded. But just so, like but, the the what the the, the right. eye thing refers to. I don't remember who says like what good is half an eye. Right. Like, well, so what good is half among an eye? others, okay. sometimes there's lots of good to half an eye actually. Right, and in fact, Dawkins uh, has a tour de force on this one. In I think it might be climbing Mount Improbable. Mm. Anyway, his point is not only is every step along the way to a full eye useful, but we have examples of them in nature, and he goes through an encyclopedic exploration of all of the partial eyes from things that sense light and dark to alert a creature that a shadow has Edges, fallen across them. Yeah. Yep. Um, but my point would be, we know this is true for language also, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody who's raised a child knows this, right? There's a point where a child might have one, one word mm -hmm. and all they can do is signal, you know, this is the moment for that word. And then they go and event eventually they get to a place where, um, you know, they're saying uh, things about morphology and complexity and, you know, they're getting advanced degrees and stuff. And the point is, at what stage along there was a little bit more uh, linguistic capacity not useful? And the answer is nowhere. It's as so much as you can muster is good. Yeah, although I don't think this question was about is, is functionality binary. Is it is symbolic language all or none? And I get, well, I read it, you, so you're approaching it from the perspective of a single lifespan developmentally, and I was thinking about it in terms of like some, <clears throat> are there, <clears throat> in, the, in the evolution of language within a species, within our species would have to be, um, or I any of the evolutions of language that have happened, uh, any of the languages that have evolved, has there been a moment when there was no symbolism and I'm not, sh I'm not sure, but even if so, has there been a moment after there was symbolism and then was it like fully symbolic all of a sudden? Certainly not. Well, my point about development is that, you know, I, frankly, I think this is a general point, right? We, we have creationists of various stripes who will protest about whether or not we could have evolved. Mm -hmm. They never bother to protest that we developed. And my mm -hmm. point is it's the identical miracle, but nobody protests it because the evidence is overwhelming. Right, and so it is the fact that the evolutionary version of this is depauperate and uh, incomplete causes there to be head scratching over whether it was possible. But the evidence, you know, the fact that a zygote turns into a Nobel laureate, right? There's no stage there where somebody says a miracle has happened because we get what all the stages are. At some superficial level. So the fact that a child goes from saying exactly nothing to that same Nobel laureate position and that each stage along the way adds some things that the child can specify means that there's no gap. Um, mm -hmm. Even if we evolutionarily can't say what that trajectory looked like. Uh, there was one other... I can't remember what the other point was. No doubt dawn on me three questions from now. All right. Well, you can come back to it. Yep. Um, if we got past the reproductive barrier, would trans still mean anything to the average person? Seems like the holy grail to passing. What's the current state of bottom surgery and how close are we to perfecting it? Oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand the question until I got to the end. So, um, to to translate for those who didn't have, probably most of you got it before we did. Um, but um, it is if if a man really could become a woman, like it, if a human really could be a transsexual, um, would would this change how people viewed trans? And I guess maybe, but it's a non-issue because it's impossible. Because mammals can't actually change sex. Well, okay. A, it will never become a nothing, right? Even if every person was free to choose. Even if it were possible. Even if even transsexual if it were possible, mammals were possible, it would not be nothing because you're still the, the sex. There, there will be a question about, you know... Uh, 
were you born with it or is it Maybelline? <laughs> <laughs> that thing, um, right? Um, but <laughs> the, <laughs> yep, that's never going to be the same, is it? Um, but that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> I can destroy as much of that kind of stuff as uh, advertising. I'm free to, to absolutely take go, it apart. Go at um, it. A, we're nowhere. We are nowhere with yeah. respect to actually being able to yeah. generate that. I mean, I know how you would do it if... Do you? Yeah, more or less. Which way? Both ways? Either way. If you were going to do it, you would you basically... You manual. You would... What? I'm about to. Okay. It's not going to be all that... It's not going to be operationalizable. Yeah. Okay. But what you would do is you would take cells... And you would cause them to grow organs that you were lacking in the person who was going to transition based on sending them information if they had landed in the zygote with the other chromosomal complement, right? I'm not saying it's possible. I mean, we can't grow you a heart yet either. But... Um, Cyber genitals. Well, yeah. it's not... They have done that in... They have done that with hearts and they have not proceeded, but it has worked. They've done something. They're, we are Some, along the road. I don't think yeah. that they have created a functional heart. Certainly, we can't hook one up no, I properly. Think they did, and it lasted for a few years and then had issues. So then, we, so then that's my point is we didn't... I'm not saying we didn't do anything that you could yeah. call that, but if we didn't successfully grow a heart that did the job... And that's, you know, in part, that's, that's the telomere issue. It, it's right. going to be many different issues. I, I'm, Anyway, not, not worth going into. But the point is, if you were going to try to do this, that'd be the way to do it. The other way to do it is the Harrison Bergeron way, which is uh, we wreck everybody's reproductive capacity and it becomes uh, fetus farms. And I did see a we're news We're already trying that, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. I saw the fetus farm thing showed up. Uh, well, I didn't know about the fetus farms, but we do appear to be wrecking everyone's reproductive, both interest and capacity, through a variety of means. Oh, absolutely. Through yes. a variety of means, yeah. yes. A multiplicity of ways in which we can take approach. the fun and utility out of sex. What is this, this fetus is, farm that you speak of? What is this fetus farm that I speak of? It, I did not actually explore it because basically I looked at it and I could infer I mean, the entire... Serious? Yeah, that's that's yeah, he's, a, that's he's a, right. That's an incredibly right. dystopian phrase. Yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. What, what does it mean? Oh, it means uh, raising babies in artificial wombs. Babies, gametes that have been donated. Again, I didn't, I didn't delve into the story, but it appeared to be uh, that artificial wombs are now sort of barely within technological range. And of course, this will create humans that have all manner of pathologies that, you know, we could um, have a great deal of dystopian fun predicting. Um, but nonetheless, that's where we are in history. Congratulations. Um, so, you know, it, it, you know, I'm not saying pregnancy is fun. Some women seem to enjoy it. I didn't. I didn't. But either. I guarantee you it's necessary to produce reasonable people. Yes. Oh, totally. Guarantee you. I don't know what all is going to be I, missing. I, I mean, I, I could point to some of the stuff that's missing. I don't know why all of it's important, but it's going to be necessary. I vividly remember you plunking yourself down in a chair at some awkward late stage in pregnancy. <laughs> Saying, this is a fucking stupid way to reproduce. <laughs> <laughs> I stand by that. Yep. I didn't argue. I also stand by, I, I stand by that. I also stand by my, at that point, entirely joking insistence that after the first one you would have to carry the second one yep and uh you being a biologist who knew that it was not possible oh then, accepted ever, my responsibility like, absolutely to carry, yes. and then when it didn't happen that way you're like well, what what can i do no what you don't know is that not a day goes by that i uh, am not grateful that men cannot <laughs> carry a human child no to be fair you did a lot of carrying after they were oh, born. Yeah, after they're born sure yeah. that's cool yeah right but, Much easier. Uh, yeah, the before they're born thing, that just does not look like fun. No, no, you're not a seahorse, so you got a free pass. Thank that I am not a seahorse for yeah. so many reasons. For so really. many reasons, yeah. No, yeah. but I, so I did some research on seahorses uh, for this uh, Substack post a long time ago. And uh, actually, the degree of, of like circulatory change in the follicles during male gestation, during what amounts to male pregnancy in seahorses, is so closely analogous to the follicular and cardio and, and circulatory changes in, uh, in female mammals, including human bodies, when they're pregnant. It's 
it's an amazing convergence. Like yeah. they, the the male seahorses really can be understood to be pregnant. It's just that the the zygote didn't start in there. The zygote got moved by mom, and then she's like, "It's all yours, bud." <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's yeah. crazy. Um, I do wonder, you know, a lot of these uh, discoveries are more recent than we think. I do wonder at what point we got ourselves straightened out with respect to uh, who does what during seahorse pregnancy. Do we have any idea how long oh, we've understood this? I, I, it, I, I could, I don't remember, but I think it's not that long ago. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine doing that work on seahorse reproduction and conclude, okay, that one just I, gave birth. That's a female. Yeah. Oh, totally. It's got to be because I, I must have done, I must have miscoded that one yep. earlier in the experiment. Yep. Yeah. Totally. All right. If the worst of the implications of the CIA involvement with JFK are true. Oh, I think it's even worse than that. Would a revolution be needed to right the ship? <laughs> uh, this is I, a, so I actually have not followed what the new revelations are, but it's not actually new revelations, is it? I mean, it's what a lot of us have thought all along. Depends how much you've been paying attention. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, no, I mean, I really think that's where, where we are, is it's like now, yes, we are definitely somewhere new where we can talk about the evidence that many of us have been talking about for quite some time. Um, so I don't know. Um, so what is, I, I, I literally don't know anything of what is supposedly new here, except that there is, there is new, now we're, now we're allowed to talk about it. Well, I haven't been paying attention. Okay. I know there was just a trove of documents released as their is on some regular schedule. Mm. I know it had some stuff in it. I don't think it has the uh, the big unanswered questions addressed, but it does fill in pieces of the puzzle, and it's not like we didn't have a lot of pieces of the puzzle pretty well filled in before. Um, and there's this uh, Tucker Carlson revelation where, you know, he's a journalist and he's got a source who was in a position to see internal documents who said, yeah, the CIA was involved in the assassination. So make of that what you will. It's not like a source couldn't have lied, but um, it will not be all that surprising in light of the evidence if the CIA was involved. Mm -hmm. And so. So the second, the, the question, would a revolution be needed to right the ship? Would it even work? So I, I, I think the problem is I've lost my taste for that kind of remedy because it's not even obvious to me what it would do. Yeah. So Yes, we need um, we need the truth part of truth and reconciliation. If reconciliation is the price, let's do it. But you know, all of the people involved are dead, all the important ones. So um, let's agree. I mean, this this is actually goes back to what we were talking about in the main podcast. Are we going to pull out of the nosedive? Mm -hmm. Something went wrong in 1963, something that we never fixed. Where has not fixing it taken us? It's taken us to the brink of self-destruction. Maybe now would be a good time to say, well, whatever people were thinking, those people are now gone. Maybe we need to know what they did. Maybe we need to figure out how deep it goes. And maybe we need to reboot something profound in our system because the departure from democracy that began with the assassination of JFK, presumably began with the assassination of JFK, has been a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, right? Something like that. But I don't, yeah, I don't, revolution, I don't even know what to make of that. Who would you revolt against exactly? Yeah. Next question. What is a book or material? Um, what is a book or more? My God! Try again. A book. I got that much. Or material, not book more or material. material. What is a book or material you would suggest to study game theory? You know, I keep being asked this. I, yep. I, I made a tweet years ago. I kept being asked this, and I gave was it my ten most important game theory concepts that people <laughs> should learn. Um, I'm not saying there isn't a book. There may well be a book. Um, that's not where that's not where I got game theory, and I'm not sure you need it. I yeah. will also say there was. Um, why am I blanking on his name? There was a gentleman working on some animations to 
reveal these central concepts some years ago. David, why am I forgetting David's last name? Um, anyway, maybe I will come up with it, but um, it would be great if there was a book. If there is, I don't know enough about any book to recommend that this is the book and that isn't the book, but game theory, you can pick up these concepts. There aren't that many of them that you need, and they are described widely. You will find videos on each of them if you want to pursue them, and I would argue that you should build up your model based mm -hmm. on these things, and that you know, I'm not sure a book would be more effective. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, are there are a couple of, are there are a couple of seminal papers, use the word. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and I've got Axelrod and Hamilton, which is, I just pulled it up because I forgot what year it was. It's 1981, The Evolution of Cooperation. You've got Garrett Hardin, Tragedy of the Commons, late 60s. Both of those published in science back before science went, whatever science went. Um, Nutter butter. Nutter butter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's going to be something really straightforward from. Um, there are a couple of other really clean, simple papers, and I think actually Dawkins does a very good job in the selfish gene in a couple of chapters as well. A and it's prisoner's not, dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma. Um, so that's not, it's not an answer. And like we, I, I do wish that there was a resource that we could point people to, but um, Axelrod and Hamilton, the evolution of cooperation, Harden, Tragedy of the Commons, Selfish Gene by Dawkins, which is a book, which is very important, you know, a little dated at this point, but surprisingly not as dated as you would expect, given that it was published in 1976. Um, I'll add one more I'm thing. For, I'm for, there's a couple of other really obvious papers that I can't think of at the moment. Um, I'm going to add a kind of applied game. I'm sure it doesn't mention the term game theory, mm -hmm. um, but there is a great paper, actually. A friend of ours asked me, we had referred to it, and he asked me for the paper. I sent it to him earlier this week. Emlyn and Oering. Oh, yeah. And so my point about Emlyn and Oering, Emlyn and Oering were ornithologists are ornithologists, who published a paper that basically said you could predict the mating system of a species based on two fundamental parameters, which had to do with the spacing of food and the predation pressure experienced by creatures in that species. And their point was... Which, which is to say spacing and timing. Yep. Yeah. So their point was if you know these parameters, then you can figure out how females will distribute themselves in a landscape. Predation drives females together, food competition drives them apart, and so to the extent that you can specify something, if the food, uh, uh, the distribution of food causes females to forage independently, then males are relegated to deploying one strategy if the food resources allow females to clump uh, such that they are more immune to their predators by virtue of schooling behavior, effectively more herding behavior, um, then males will deploy a different strategy. They effectively are monopolizable by right. males. By and, small and numbers of males. A small number of males, and you see the conditions ripe for the evolution of polygyny. Right. So anyway, the point is, it's such a great example of the such power a, of this style such a of thinking, paper. right? The basic point is that males are not driving the choice of these systems. Males are responding in a tiny number of logical ways to a parameter over which they have no control. Yeah. Um, and it creates these, you know, creates all sorts of things. It creates, you know, rutting antelope with antlers, right? Um, so you can right, just wait a second. Show me. Rutting antelope. No. It creates rutting deer with antlers. Ah, antelope have horns, not yeah, antlers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The distinction being that horns aren't dropped, right? Yep. Uh, and they're also made of and different they're material. Yeah. yeah. Uh, antlers are also skeletal, but. Um, they're disposable skeleton. Yeah, they're, I think they're not, they're not covered. They're exoskeleton. <laughs> Um, here it is. I just show my screen here for a moment. So, uh, high, like 
this is one of the very few, if not the only. Like those other two papers I mentioned are also really good. This one is one I pulled it up to, The Evolution of Cooperation by Axel Rodden Hamilton. But this, which is also published in Science, 1977, Ecology, Sexual Selection, and the Evolution of Many Systems. I think I used, I, I think I assigned this every single year. Um, yeah, teaching it's a really good, and it is just good paper. Yeah. Extra, it is so beautifully done. It is so, and it's short, uh, and it's clean, and it's just careful. Like it, it, like if you want an example of how to think evolutionarily, the ways that that we do, that we try to, like it is just, it is beautiful on this paper. Yep, and I think people who this is uh, are yeah. more used to science and the way it's developed in the present will be surprised that this paper is not stupid and wrong. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. one of the great Lots of predictions that uh, could falsify what they're talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that kind of sort of a scientific thinking. Yeah, yeah. without any science-ish or science -y stuff. Right. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We've grown cynical. Uh, I think that, that's... Mm, it's not all us. Yeah, and I don't think it's, you know, snarky. I, I'll cop to snarky. I'm not going right. to cop to cynicism yet. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, do you think Musk could or should apply a First Amendment abiding free speech policy? For example, could a Twitter exist where Kanye doesn't get banned? Um, I believe it would be a mistake to try to apply the First Amendment directly as if Twitter was governmental because you don't want to hold yourself responsible. We hogtie the federal government. We hogtie all government from violating First Amendment rights because it is necessary due to the ferocious power of the state. You can back that off in order to manage something like Twitter while defending the value Right? There's lots of, you know, let's take doxing, for example. It may be legal to dox somebody. It has no value. It has a danger. And it is quite possible to create a Twitter in which that does not exist, where a protected mode of speech does not exist because it literally creates no value in, in the space of Twitter. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you could... Um, you know, you could ban sexually explicit content, which is sexually explicit content deserving of First Amendment protection. Yeah, it is. Um, is it okay to create a space where it isn't because the value it adds to the space is less than the cost to the space? Sure. So mm -hmm. I don't think the First Amendment should be applied to Twitter. I believe that the value of the First Amendment with respect to expressing ideas and differences of opinion is the key thing that Twitter is well positioned to be important uh, with respect to. And so it's the spirit of the First Amendment that should be applied to Twitter, not the letter. Cool. Thank you kindly for another year of logical thinking and comfortable pets. If dogs beget dogs and frogs beget frogs, how did frogs beget dogs? Well, is, frogs didn't beget dogs. No, frogs did not beget dogs. The this stem is, ancestor, the lissom, the amphibian ancestor of frogs, share went down a different branch that ultimately became dogs. Yeah, in one of its many branches, uh, frogs are modern amphibians that. Um, do not, we do not, um, we, we were never frogs. We were amphibians. We came out of the water uh, and became tetrapods and had to retool everything. You know, respiratory, visual, olfactory, locomotory, muscle systems, like everything had to be retooled once we are now on land rather than in water. <clears throat> um, and that early that early tetrapod, which was an amphibian, was not a frog or toad or a salamander or a newt or a Sicilian. And all toads are frogs and all newts are salamanders. So there's just three types of modern amphibians, but that early one, that f those first ones weren't any of those because those evolved later from that stem ancestor. Yep. I would add just one other thing. 
Uh, if you think about the world in which our ancestor went through this amphibious phase, and you think, so the world already had on it plants, insects, etc. And you think about an animal relegated to life in the water, an animal really constrained to it, you know, a, a traditional fishy fish, as it were. Well, a fishy fish that can reach a foot beyond the highest place that the water gets to has whatever opportunity is there. And there's actually quite a bit, right? You could find dead things that had fallen in the water that wash up to the meander line, and a creature that can access that thing one foot beyond the water has an advantage. So you would expect there is pressure to innovate the ability to just go just a little farther. And the point I'm getting at is that is also true um, two feet from the water. There are opportunities that one foot is not enough. It's true three feet from the water. And so and sometimes what's you know eight feet from the water is the next pool right. that isn't drying up. And Maybe. so anyway, what I would say is in the context of what we call the adaptive landscape, where opportunities are peaks, you have a gentle slope, right? The point is the farther you can get from the water, the better off you are. And the thing about amphibians is amphibians are constrained to water for reproduction, but they get better and better at reaching farther and farther from the water, and there is nothing but opportunities out there. And then the thing that uh, amniotes do, uh, that is to say the reptiles that descended from those amphibian ancestors, is they have eggs that are tolerant of not being in water. So they have the ability to get even that much farther, and really what you're talking about is a kind of exploring where the farther you go, the more advantage there is. So the pressure to keep innovating, how do I get just a little farther than the last one, escape the competition of everybody who's gotten to the one-foot level by getting to the three-foot level. If there are empty niches, uh, there is uh, opportunity for exploration, opportunity and pressure for exploration. Well, so I would just say yep. uh, that when you say reptiles, I know that you are including, uh, th that's reptilomorphs uh, and, and also includes what will become mammals, and Said therefore the includes yes. us. Yes. What's that? Said the reptile. Said the reptile. Yes. Exactly. No. Totally. Um, and yeah. of course, reptiles include birds. I guess. I guess what I'm really getting at is, there can be a niche that is so displaced from the creature that might access it that it's impossible or nearly impossible to get there. That is not the case when you have a gentle slope where every intervening stage gets you some advantage. And so you would expect the evolution of something uh, terrestrial tetrapody from a uh, amphibious ancestor because there's no place at which getting more access to the land doesn't provide new advantage. It's a lot of pressure. It's very consistent. Mm -hmm. um, so somewhere in there is the answer to the question that you were asking, how is it that uh, frogs, which... Heather and I will take to be ancestral amphibians give mm -hmm. rise to dogs, and the answer is constant, constant evolutionary pressure in that direction, which provided reward all along the way. Mm -hmm. With with some moments, like you know, the move on to land is is as I started by saying, you know, really gigantic. You just you have to retool. I mean, just just think about the different refractive indices of water versus air. And then the different pressure that is uh, placed on you by gravity on land versus in water. You know, you, you are a kind of shallow water dwelling fishy thing that also is getting some four legs that can kind of do some moving around in shallow water. And occasionally you're sticking your snout up and maybe gulping some air and such. That's a totally different landscape from being on land and having gravity whoomp like down on you and you know you 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 you're also at that point in this sort of splayed this splayed position where it's you've been moving uh as a fish uh from side to side and now gravity is putting even more pressure on you to smash you flat to the earth's surface so there's just you know that that is a remarkable moment the move to land, the evolution of tetrapods, of tetrapodi, um, but also of all of the other things that have to happen because it is such a giant transition. And therefore, you know, not only is that the subject of a lot of, of research interest, but so too are the returns to the sea. So, you know, we have in mammals 
three or four returns to the sea, partial and complete. You know, we have the whales, which includes the dolphins, and we have the manatees, and we have the pinnipeds, which is the seals and sea otters and walruses, and then there are partial and returns. Sea otters, sea lions. Uh, sorry, seals and sea lions and and walruses, and then the partial returns, the sea otters. Yep. Right? Uh, and river otters. Actually, the otters. The otters are sort of a partial return. Um, but you also have in reptile space sea snakes, uh, which um, actually... Uh, go on land in these little like shelves and caves largely to uh, to reproduce, but they otherwise live entirely in the water. I think I'm remembering that correctly. Yes, you at are. least at least it some may not of them be, do. It may not be every species. But yeah, at least some, some of the do. sea snakes do that. And incidentally, the sea snakes are all of their elapids. They're most closely related to things like um, cobras. They're super crazy dangerous, but they're mostly pretty placid because you're an idiot if you mess with a snake in the water. Yeah, wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah, there there have definitely been obstacles. The fighting gravity thing is rough. Uh, the, the drying out. I mean, just I mean, like it's winter here. Like we're all like, oh god, our skin is so dry. Well, imagine if you've never been in air at all, and now so yeah. we have this um, the stratum corneum um, is this new new evolutionary feature of tetrapods that allows for skin not to be just constantly losing water. Yeah, the amniote. Uh, well, then that, that's later. The amnion in the egg. That's the, later, though. Right. Okay. Well, I've got the order wrong. What? The, I've got the order wrong. What was your first one on the list? The stratium corneum. Stratium corneum. Yes. Which is a term I'm just I looking totally at one of my lectures. Now. A layer of dead skin cells, usually keratinized, uh, which also is a tetrapod snaphmorphic All right. Stratium corneum comes before the amnion, which protects the egg. Uh, then there's the uh, the gravitational. Oh no, that's going to be second in this list. Uh, I'm not going to do it. I can't do the list. Okay, I thought you were, you weren't uh, you weren't building a pun here. Uh, I was going to argue that among the many challenges, you had the the Hoover administration. Um, that was a challenge. It came rather later. Yes. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Somewhat later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the evolution of the neck. Yes. Seriously. How do fish who are trying to like nibble the algae off of coral get position themselves? They move their whole bodies, right? If you've ever been in the water, if you've ever snorkeled or scuba dived or anything, they move their whole bodies. They don't need necks. They don't have any need for necks. Once you're on land, you want to be able to do this. So you don't have to move your whole body. And so the neck happens at the level of tetrapods. Right. I mean, imagine how would you shush somebody behind you in the theater if you didn't have a neck? Yeah, theater... Definitely evolves after neck. Right. There For reasons is. that should now be obvious to our audience. Embarrassing. <laughs> Embarrassing evolution biologists. My God. Okay. Um, which one was that? Ah, dogs beget dogs, etc. Okay, we have a three part. It's just in three pieces here that I'm not sure I know what it means. Love to you too. Question. In Mosquito's Game Theory... Citizens are divided in two blocks. Rulers choose to reward or not. By amalgamating people of color or LGBT or women and trans, women and minorities, a number of blocks can be minimized, moving the system towards more authoritarianism while questioning black trans lives mattering means excommunication. Intersexualists can cash out, though. Thoughts? I'm going to have to sit down with this and, and yeah I, just, I, I think the I think the premise is a uh, mosquitoes mosquito I don't I don't know what the premise is yeah. do you have any thoughts or ideas about the causes of mass whale beachings is that happening now I don't know that that's happening now I don't know that that is happening now yeah um, I would if that's happening now I'd like to know that it is uh, but I don't know it yeah, I've got some some thoughts. A, there's a question about whether or not an animal that is going to die is taking itself out of the water. You know, we don't leave corpses on the surface; we bury them. Is mm. this, you know, something of that nature? Is there a reason that having the corpse in an area where relatives are going to be swimming would be bad? Um, that would not predict beachings where animals are just passing through, which I think are, as far as we know, somewhat common. Nowhere to predict beachings of uh, apparently young, healthy animals. Yes. Well, that's the question, is how often are you missing 
a pathology, right? Mm -hmm. If a whale had a leukemia, mm -hmm. you know, a necropsy wouldn't necessarily reveal it. That's true. Or maybe it would. Yep. Um, but in any case, don't know. There's, there's, there's lots to be answered. It's also possible that these animals are being disrupted by human alterations to things, you know, we yeah, introduce all sure. kinds of noises yeah. and chemicals and could we be just disrupting something? And the question yeah. is how common, yes. yeah, how common would these things be? Places they have to avoid because they're polluted either, you know, with things we can see or more often probably like chemically polluted, like, oh, that I can't take the usual route I would take because that's going to be toxic to me. I have to go this way. Oh, damn. Yeah. I made an error. Yeah. If the person, now Elliot Page, now called Elliot Page, committed a crime when he was Ellen Page, pre-transition, but it was only discovered post-transition, who would be charged? Or would the DA be unable to file charges because the person no longer exists? I mean, this is part of the problem with the whole identity thing. Yeah. And this is part of what you were arguing in, yep. the, in the first couple hours, is you, know, you, don't, you're, you're, you are the same person. You can change your name, you can change your hair color, you can change how you present, you can say that you've changed your gender identity, but that's not a real thing, so whatever. Yep. Um, and you can change how you present to the world in terms of what sex you present as, even though you cannot change what sex you actually are, but you're still the same person. You can't, that's not, that's not negotiable. History is hi history. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, you know, similarly... You know, for, for any of these, for any of these people who have declared themselves radically different from who they used to be, uh, if a crime was discovered from before then, well, um, glad you changed. I hope you changed a lot, but you still committed a crime and you still need to be held accountable. Yep. Following the Mrs. Ms. and Ms. logic, wouldn't adding a genderless pronoun make sense? Pronoun. I, I guess I read that the first time as honorific. Like, wouldn't adding a genderless honorific make sense? And I don't know that that's not what is meant here. We could try to address both. Yeah, I, I don't see this argument. No, but um, I do, like, a genderless honorific, I still, you know, I still, uh, sexless, really, right? Like, the thing is, male and female are real, and they do, they, 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 they don't change, and you, whereas you can change if you're married or not, right? Um, and there should be situations where it actually doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman that you're, is going to be writing the report or something, right? But yeah, but uh, mm, I really uh, this is suggested with some regularity, and I which the pro, a pronoun a genderless pronoun, at it, mm -hmm. right? Because so I was I was referring I was responding to what I thought they might have meant, which is the honorific, a generalist right. honorific. Even that. I, I'm not convinced that it's a great idea because it's not the same thing, but... Not only is it not the same thing, but it is a cryptic attack on meaning. Okay? If there is such a thing as transitioning, in mm -hmm. some sense, it is transitioning from one thing to another. So you've landed in the category that already exists. Okay? But there are many aspects of reality that don't get referred to in our honorifics. doesn't make any difference. If I say... You know, um, well, I, I now see a problem, which is that doctor is genderless. Mm -hmm. And so it creates the very problem I'm going to complain about. Yeah. Most, I mean, most of these meritocratic earned, earned titles are often gen ungendered, I think. Esquire, doctor, yep. professor. Yeah. In any case, in, in some, if, if you say Mr. or Ms., you are providing a clue to linguistically how to uh, continue on with a discussion, right? If, um, you know, Ms. Henderson mm -hmm. has presented a paper that something, mm -hmm. you know, she provided. Oh, what did she argue? Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. it provides evidence. If it's, you know, Dr. Henderson, then I don't know whether I'm supposed to say he or she. So that actually creates a problem. But the, the reason that I'm really bristling at this is there's an idea, well, if you believe in trans, then we should do something for them. And the answer is, if I believe in trans, then they have transitioned from a category we had to a different category we had. I don't need to break up language or become authoritarian and force people to do something they haven't been doing 
to deal with this. If I believe that this is real, the categories already exist, the language already exists, and I don't want to create a special privilege. Well, I guess I would, I disagree with one thing you said there, which is that someone who is trans is transitioning from a category we had to a new category. Well, in every sense that is meaningful, that's what they're doing. They are either not transitioning at all, right? From the point of view of talking about their chromosomes, they haven't done a damn thing. Mm -hmm. If they have, if they're going to transition so the, that... The, the gametes that they could produce. Right, yeah. so that socially we are going to treat them by this new category, they've transitioned to a category for which we had language. I don't want to create a special privilege for this, mm. right? So it doesn't require it. And the only, frankly, here, here's the best argument against it. Let's say that we did create a genderless pronoun for people who had transitioned. Aren't we now ghettoizing them? Aren't we now saying, well, this isn't a real woman? Well, A, there's then going to be pressure for everyone to use that one. Right. Right. Uh, uh, and I saw another problem that I lost. Yeah, I, I think I think in any case we're at the same place, which is you are creating a problem in order to solve a non-problem, mm -hmm. and you are deciding that because there's linguistic complexity surrounding how we deal with this, that the right thing to do is to fix the language, and the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Fix the issue. Figure out what it is you are and are not entitled to do and what it does and does not change about where you're allowed to go. Yep. And, you know, the language comes last, not first. And to mm -hmm. the extent that because language is the easy place to say, here is the answer to the question, that the people who are pointing to the language are in a position to discuss the complexities of this? No, these are the last people. Yeah. Right? These people do not understand the real complexities. They want to deal with the language because it doesn't require a lot of work for them to figure out what to command. Yep. When did we start, Zach? Um, you've been talking for 55 minutes. All right. We're going to stop soon then. Humans appear to have a brain circuit for dividing in half visually, not other fractions. Thoughts on causes? Is it just for sharing reasons? I don't know that I agree with the premise here. I'm not sure I know what we're talking about. It is, you can look at something, the, the premise is humans can look at something and say, okay, half there, half here. Yep. But humans don't tend to do as good a job with quarters or thirds or fifths. Now, of course, quarters, eighths, sixteenths, of course, is, is easy because it's just more halves, so that's maybe cheating. Yep. Yep. Um, but thirds, I feel like a yep. lot of people can do, I can do. Totally. Um, and it's not as precise, though. So maybe the, maybe the point is like, yeah, we're a lot better have halves. No, but the smaller the fraction, the less precise it's going to be. So it's not, I'm not convinced that this no, actually... Better at quarters than thirds. Better at quarters than thirds. Yeah, because it's another half. But it's smaller and... In any case, even, even if it's the case, I'm not sure how much of this is inherent and how much of this is downstream of the math that we study in school and yeah and the kind of visual framework that we grow up in so the question yeah. would be you know are there are there other cultures who grow up in very different environments in which people have a really easy time dividing things into fifths for instance yeah you know and and do those cultures have fruits that emerge for three months of the year where depending on you know if you cut them the way that is traditional to cut them in that culture they happen to be the uh, pentagonally symmetric, radially symmetric with five parts, yep. right? There are fruits like that. Sure. Um, so it seems, yeah, it seems likely to be a developmental yep. situation. I understand about oxytocin, but what might be an evolutionary explanation for the tendency of men to fall asleep after sex? We're stumped. Maybe to encourage the woman to stay put, increasing the likelihood of pregnancy, question mark? Hmm. I don't know. I've actually I've never given this any thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, a I don't know about the, you know, there's obviously something to it, but the fact that sex is relegated to bed, I'm just not sure how to disentangle. Well, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. If if. Uh, yeah. Are men really likely to fall asleep after sex? At nine in the morning. I don't think so. Yeah. Noon? 
I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to answer the question. Yeah. Because... So it's, I guess maybe that's why it just this seemed like uh, just maybe a conflation of like. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, if, if it's in an elevator, I'm, <laughs> like, <you> know, like... <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's not just a trope. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or a trope or downstream of, uh, you know, a particular culture's predilections. Yeah. Okay. We actually only have three more here and two of them are just are ones that, you anyway, know, quick. With the Twitter files coming out, maybe you should ask Elon Musk if there is any more information about the censorship of Unity 2020. I absolutely want to know. Yeah. Um, Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. What are some of your favorite holiday books, movies, shows, songs, and traditions? I don't have an answer to that right now, but in the pursuit of getting all of the questions answered this week, I thought I'd read it. Do you have any? No, I mean, I think surviving the holidays is... Okay. is no, the... <laughs> we're not going there. Um, I always did, like, of, of the um, snark about the holidays in the middle, why? Why do that? Because I don't have an answer. I don't know that I have these traditions. Do you, what are some of your favorite holiday books, movies, shows, songs, and traditions? I mean, we have a Hanukkah tradition that we wrote about in Hunter Gatherer's Guide. I always love a, a Christmas tree um, lit with simple lights and a lot of pretty glass ornaments. Just a lot of reflections, a lot, right, a lot, of, a lot of lights. And the two Christmas carols that I think I am most drawn to are Silent Night and Oh Holy Night. All right. I, and Zach has something to add, too. Is it going to be snarky? No, it's not snarky. Okay. <laughs> I have always liked the song, Baby, It's Cold Outside, and it has become my absolute favorite now that it drives bad people crazy. Awesome. Okay. And, and Zach, who is not mic'd for some reason. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, Coldplay and Fleet Foxes as wonderful winter bands. Coldplay, Coldplay and Fleet Foxes? Yes. I don't, I don't know Fleet Foxes. I do. Okay. Yeah. And are they winter bands just yeah, because so of the names? Three songs. There's okay. Christmas lights by Coldplay, and there's White Winter Hymnal. I don't know if they can hear me, but White Winter Hymnal by uh, Fleet Foxes and, and Christmas lights. Christmas by lights by Coldplay. And lots of other songs. They, they're, they're okay. Bands. Well, you should. You should. Uh, we should listen to these tonight with your grandparents. I. I, I do. I have been. You have been with them? No. Okay. On my own. I feel like. You'll notice how much I drive. I get a lot of time to listen to music. All right. Okay. Um, final question. At what age, actually perfect segue, at what age do you start letting your kids go out unsupervised? Apparently too early. <laughs> <laughs> Without the neighborhood crew, it's just not the same as when we were kids. That's definitely true, although um, we were lucky to have bought, you know, they, <clears throat> until four and a half years ago, we lived in Olympia. And we literally lived across a dead end road from the thousand acre evergreen campus that's mostly forest. And so they were able to go out into the forest from a young age. Um, once we had the dog with their dog, but even before we had the dog uh, and play and build stuff and um, explore. And, uh, and we also, they also, at some point, I don't remember when Jack moved in across the street, but um, a, a, a friend of Toby's, exactly Toby's age moved in across the street. And so we, there's a little bit of a crew there, um, but it is different. On the other hand, we didn't, we both grew up in sort of suburban-ish for LA neighborhoods and did to some degree have like a crew that we could run around with. Yeah. Um, but, and our kids didn't, but they also didn't grow up in suburbia in the same way. Right. Yeah. In fact, you know, in the seventies and eighties, you went out with your crew. If you didn't come back, it was your time. <laughs> More or less how I think the adults thought of it. <laughs> no. <I don't. laughs> Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> Life is cheap, apparently. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, that's it. I guess that's it. That's it. We will be back on New Year's Eve. And before then, there will be another Dark Horse, Dark Horse episode dropping on Wednesday of this week. But uh, New Year's Eve, we'll be back. We will... We will see you then. No, you will see us then if you choose to. We will not see you then, but we will know you're there. And uh, until then, be good to the ones you love, eat good food, and get outside. Be well, everyone. <laughs>